Good morning. Welcome uh, to this webinar hosted jointly by CREST and the uh, Devon and Cornwall Serious Violence Programme. I'm delighted you're all here to join us. My name is Harvey Redgrave. I'm the CEO of CREST, uh, the country's leading crime, policing and criminal justice consultancy. Um, yeah, we've got a fantastic lineup of panelists here to talk to you today. Uh, and hopefully some time as well for Q&A uh, and, and a bit of discussion at the end. So um, before further, uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over to the Commissioner, Alison Hernandez, uh, Police and Crime Commissioner for Devon and Cornwall, uh, and Co-Chair of the Serious Violence uh, Prevention Programme. Alison. Thank you, Harvey. Um, welcome everybody. I can see people are still joining us as we start to speak, so um, you'll catch it as, as we go. Um, I suppose that the first thing to, to say is we're an area of Devon and Cornwall. We're the second lowest crime rate area in the country. We're often the lowest for things like burglary and acquisitive crime like theft, um, but violence still makes up the bulk of our challenge. Uh, where we are. We don't meet the threshold for the government to fund a violence reduction unit, which obviously we're proud that we're, we're not at the scale of other places, but we recognise that we wanted to make an effort and tackle some of the challenges that we had in Devon and Cornwall. What was also helpful is the police and crime panel who scrutinised me as a commissioner um, were challenging me about the efforts we were making to tackle violence and we didn't really have a clear program and strategy in place um, and I think one of the things about why we decided on a joint program the Chief Constable and I Sean Sawyer at the time was because we realized this was new territory for us we didn't want to follow um, exactly what the government's restrictions were around, around violence reduction units we wanted to look at violence prevention um, very much our inherent violence that we have in our communities and we wanted to look to break that cycle. So we know, as you will, that time and again, policing sees history repeating itself with the same families, the same faces, the same frustration. And that challenge of the thresholds in the partner agencies of what help is available to those young people who might be witnessing violence in the home, or actually being a victim of violence in the home and that inability to act quickly um, and collectively as a, as a community. So we were really keen to see what we could do to work as a team with our experience in the Office of Police and Crime Commissioner for commissioning services and the police's experience for being able to operationally make a difference immediately. And I tell you, trying to put those two things together um, was a real challenge and I think one of the bits that is really key is um, because we didn't get the funding from the government, we had to put a proposal together to pre present to the police and crime panel my proposals for a council tax increase, which was going to focus on tackling violence in our communities. Um, and that's why the teamwork has really helped. Um, the police and crime panel who've been scrutinising me saying we weren't doing enough, couldn't really refuse. Um, and it meant that we got buy-in from a range of partners to move forward. I think one of the, the, the really big things for us is we've had a couple of successes with other home office funding that we've been successful in. So we've got the Turning Corners project that we have in Devon, which is very much looking at gang violence. And we were one of the first areas to get a gang injunction um, into our communities because we had such a problem. Um, and we've managed to continue that Turning Corners project after the Home Office funding um, because we have this prevention partnership in place. And also Pathfinder, another example where the police and I and my office have worked together, where we're doing deferred caution, deferred charges. We were the second place in the country besides Durham to actually start getting that installed into a force area. And we did because we did that together as a Chief Constable and a PCC, um, we felt this was the right thing to do for tackling violence. Also, don't forget community safety partnerships. We absolutely could not survive in our geography without working with our partners. And that collective um, power that we've got locally and the serious violence duty that is you know, now becoming their responsibility um, means that actually the Chief Constable and the Police and Crime Commissioner working together works really well there because the police are 
the actual specified authority under the serious violence duty and my office is not. So we really do need to lean into each other to make that work with partners. And uh, this, this collaboration is, is where it's really helped. One of the things we did realize, I'd say as a learning point from the initial work that we did is that you can't delegate leadership. Uh, when we first started out, we had the chief executive of my office and the deputy chief constable leading this piece of work. And both the chief constable and I recognized because we were breaking ground. We, didn't, we were actually finding our way because we didn't want to follow a specific route that the government were going down because we were trying to look at prevention. Um, and it meant that we had to roll our sleeves up and actually get directly involved. Um, and that's why we recognized you can't delegate it down. You have to really be part of that strategic thinking and bringing those values and principles to the table about where you're gonna go next. So I suppose I'm gonna hand over now to the temporary chief constable who is um, looking after the force in the former chief constable's absence. And luckily Jim was the deputy chief constable at the time. So he's been heavily involved in the programme and I think the police's efforts to be seen to tackle violence has been a really key factor for our communities but we want to stop it happening in the first place so over to you Jim uh, thank you Commissioner always a, a pleasure to share the stage with you and um, good morning ladies and gentlemen colleagues uh, my pleasure and privilege to be with you uh, for what is just a short time this morning but I really welcome the opportunity to talk um, with no small degree of pride and enthusiasm around our serious, serious violence prevention program. Um, the Commission has done a really good job of laying out some of the, um, the history behind it, and I'll just pick that up from a, a force perspective. So, as has been referenced, uh, as the Deputy Chief Constable at the time, we're going back to about 2019, uh, we, we were having conversations, um, the OPCC and, and the force, around how we could um, really develop a strategy around serious violence prevention. And the context for that was uh, the macro down to the micro. So at the macro, at the national level, um, nationally, police forces were um, experiencing a sustained increase in the reported levels of um, violence with injury, around about a 40-45% 40, 40, increase over the previous five-year period. And that was in a, a broader context of a crime profile that was seeing significant reductions in other types of crime. So serious violence violence with injury really stood out as an outlier in terms of uh, uh, an enduring and indeed an increasing challenge for um, police forces nationally and indeed as locally. At the same time, the national debate around uh, the approach in terms of being more trauma informed and that whole public um, health approach to safety and serious violence prevention was really emerging as a clear and coherent narrative and the force uh, was engaged in those conversations both through the National Police Chiefs Council and through dialogues with partners locally and so that context really helped to shape our thinking locally uh, and at the same time the third bit so moving down to the micro the local level and Commission has already referenced this turning corners uh, for us was a really turning moment uh, for the force because it really taught us the value that can be drawn from a really coordinated, collaborative piece of community strength-based interventions targeted at, at those most vulnerable, those on the edge of offending, those families that were exposed um, to the issues that we know uh, lie behind serious violence and the young people that were, as I say, were on the periphery of those offences coming to the attention of a range of agencies. And that Turning Corners project, supported by National Home Office funding, really set um, a template for how we wanted to work across a broader scale. So the concept of scaling up the ethos of turning corners and those gang injunctions that the commissioner um, referenced. Again, we were the first force, the first policing area in the country to successfully secure those gang injunctions. And they were difficult at the time and they were resource intensive. But again, but again it shone a light on how we could work differently using uh, both the legislative framework available, but more importantly, a collective will and a collective capacity to address issues more upstream rather than simply reacting and feeding the criminal justice system. And we all know the challenges around the capacity of the criminal justice system, both in terms of its capacity to deal with these issues and indeed deliver interventions that prevent future offending. Um, and so at that time, the conversation turned to how do we develop a, a prevention approach around serious violence that we can sustain? 
Um, and the key to this, the absolute key to this is a collective will and ambition to deliver a long-term funding arrangement that allowed both the force, the OPCC, and importantly, our partners locally to commit long-term, to, to deploy dedicated resources to this, to the way I see this, to invest in order to invest further. Because we all know the challenges of short-term funding bids and pockets of funds that become available. It's great for the time that you've got it, but the cliff edge rapidly approaches and therefore the willingness, the ability for partners to really commit to that long-term ambition it is difficult to achieve. Now, what we were able to do through the support of the Commissioner and the Police and Crime Plan, and ultimately our local communities through the precept uplift and council tax, was to develop that four-year approach, which allowed, as I said, um, the force to commit long-term resources, allowed us to recruit through the OPCC dedicated resources, and you'll hear from a key, a key kind of um, center point for this whole program, Becky Inskip today, who's brought a great deal of wealth, uh, a great wealth of experience and no short amount of energy to the whole program, which has kept it going through what has, and we've had some challenges, particularly in the early stages, in terms of building and then sustaining momentum. Uh, but we've learned through those challenges and, and the program stands on its own two feet now. Um, and you'll hear a lot, obviously, of the detail during the course of this session. So from my perspective, uh, in terms of representing Devon and Cornwall Police, as I said, really proud of this. Challenges remain, um, not least how we sustain this beyond the four, di four years. Uh, but, you know, we all know that if we really want to seriously approach the issue of preventing serious violence within our communities, that's not a six month piece of work. It's not a 12 month piece of work. It may not even be a four year piece of work, um, but we have to start somewhere and the investment has to come from us at this time. Uh, and so at that point, I'll hand back to Harvey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, and to that point on the, the, the scale of this, I think it's, it's well made. You know, if we take this sort of national context, serious violence has been increasing since 2014. Uh, nationally. We had a sort of brief uh, hiatus during the pandemic uh, when overall crime fell and, and violence was part of that, but we're now seeing a return to pre-pandemic trends. Violence with injury is up nationally by 22% over the last year. And so the, the, uh, the long-term nature of this and the need for a holistic whole systems approach uh, and the approach that Devon and Cornwall has taken, I think, uh, is really pertinent, particularly as we we head towards the the rollout of the the serious violence duty. Um, a lot of our research that that we've done at Crest over the last two to three years on serious violence has has involved looking beyond enforcement. Of course, enforcement is part of the part of the picture. It has to be there has to be a tough policing response to this, uh, but also the need to bring partners in schools, health services, children services and really try and deal with some of that vulnerability at an early stage, uh, particularly as we know the pandemic again has exacerbated some of that, uh, some of that vulnerability. And we know that, that children have, have dropped out of the system and, and we've heard from practitioners how difficult it's been to, uh, to keep track of, of some of the impacts of that. Uh, and so as, as we sort of head towards a potentially tough fiscal climate, as, as we know about at the moment, uh, and we look at the sort of trends around vulnerable young people, uh, there are some pretty difficult headwinds um, facing us. Uh, so all the more reason why I think today's event is important and, and hopefully also uplifting because it demonstrates um, what you can achieve with a bit of strategic clarity and, and leadership and uh, getting partners in around the table uh, and setting out some of those uh, strategic objectives. I'm going to hand over now to... Um, uh, some colleagues who have been much more closely involved in, in the delivery of the uh, serious violence prevention program uh, over the last two years. Uh, Becky Inskip, who's the program director for the, pro for the program and the partnership uh, and, and has driven much of this, as Jim just said. Uh, Becky, if I could hand over to you now to, to talk through some of this in more detail. Thank you. Thanks, Harvey, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, really nice to, to be joined by people across uh, the country today, and hopefully um, you'll enjoy what we have to tell you. Um, so 
we wanted to turn most of our attention for, for what is the substantive um, bit of today's agenda to really go through the roadmap and the kind of public health journey that we as a programme and very much we as a, as a, a collective team and um, together with Crest Advisory have, have been on since the programme really started in, in April 2020. Um, my post actually commenced last February, so I joined the programme after it started, which is always quite an interesting uh, start to, to any, any role. Um, and I was really blessed to join right in this very first phase of the far left, where the mandate had already been established for the programme. Um, and, and from that point on, we then followed what is a traditional public health journey. And many of you on the call today will be familiar with the SARA model the surveillance analysis response and assessment and and like any true public health model we got to the end of our assessment period that we'll take you through today and started again started back at that surveillance and and, and that's really where where we're heading into at the commencement of of the next calendar year and so what i wanted to really kind of touch upon i guess now is that um this has been a real collective effort that has been made up of a lot of small components of products and what we thought might be valuable based on a lot of the questions we've had from other areas about our approach as a non-BRU, and as many of you ready yourselves for the duty, is to go through what each of these stages in this timeline, what they've produced and what lessons we've built along the way. Um, so we'll go through each of these five stages in turn, and I'll be bringing in my colleagues, James and, and, and Eleanor from Crest Advisory as we go. Um, so. Greg, if you could go to the first slide on the mandate, that would be great. So this for me is has been absolutely central to what we've got right in Devon and Cornwall. Um, so what do we mean by the mandate? Essentially, this is uh, making sure that top down in the organisation and across the policing organisations, both the force and the APCC, but as well as our partners, there's been a collective will, as, as Jim described it, to take a, a different approach to looking at violence. Um, and that has meant quite a, a lot for me in a, a programme director role. So it's allowed me to be able to, and you know, to speak very truthfully, dangle the, 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 the titles of the chief constable and the police and crime commissioner and the chief execs of all our partner organisations when needed to break down barriers and move things quickly. And I think a lot of the time, a lot of initiatives struggle perhaps to get off the ground um, because they don't necessarily have that strategic get go for the beginning. So I'm really grateful to have started what is a, you know, a, a huge bit of, of work that will take you through today with that blessing from the start. And that real joint venture between the commissioner and the chief constable in particular has been so helpful to get partners on board. And you'll hear later today, from Cornwall Council, um, one of the four local authorities across Devon and Cornwall, um, about how they found that, that collective will being presented to them. But somebody has to lead this agenda. And in the duty, whilst there's no lead authority, we've certainly found making headway as a joint policing uh, team really useful in gathering um, the uh, collective will of partners. The second thing I want to pull out here in terms of lessons is, is um, without blowing my own trumpet, um, my post. Um, so it's quite distinct and it's quite unusual. Um, so I'm programme director for, for Serious Violence Prevention and I'm employed um, and I job share essentially across both the force and the OPCC. So as Alison alluded to earlier, I'm able to navigate and draw on the OPCC's commissioning and um, expertise, its reach into partners, its ability to scrutinise and hold partners to account, as well as um, influence on uh, community safety objectives through the police and crime plan across the, the peninsula and the wide region we cover. But equally the same, I'm able to draw on the police's resources. I'm able to draw on the vehicles of delivery that we have from youth offending teams through to youth intervention officers, through to neighbourhood policing, and indeed um, into um, major crimes when we're looking in the context of homicide. So I've got the full disposal of both organisations underneath the programme. And all those organisations um, and all those touch points touch partners in a variety of ways. So leaning um, very uh, nimbly between those two organisations has been key. Um, it has meant that 
it's a bit of a confusing post to have when you feel like you belong to two organizations and there's of course gates that need to be kept up but I couldn't urge um, colleagues enough when they're thinking about perhaps a, a post and how to position it. We've certainly found that having a strategic post like mine in place, feeding right up into the chief and the commissioner um, has been groundbreaking in terms of moving this forward. And I can urge you all to consider it more and we're happy to share more on that experience. And as a result of that setup, I actually have a team that is split across the force in the OPCC. So I have a police analyst in the program and I have dotted lines into various project managers within the force on top of a, a, a comms manager in the OPCC and, and support uh, functions as well. So that, that structure is quite unique and, and it really works well for us. The next bit of the, the kind of lessons I'd like to draw out is that the governance structure that shapes that work. So we started off with a strategic board and um, from the get go uh, chaired jointly by the commissioner and the chief. And, you know, I cannot tell you how true it is um, in terms of Alison's comments about rolling her sleeves up and getting stuck in and um, the ability to be able to go through the strategic needs assessment that Crest will tell you about as the first bit of this journey and having the commissioner and the chief looking at the very details of how our crime and levels of harm have changed over the past five years from rising rates of exclusions to rising rates of children in care up to violence of injury and an increase in homicides we could look at all of that together and step back and think about what vision we want to paint and as soon as that vision was painted um, at that strategic level, that then triggered a, an operational governance structure to, to take place. And all of that um, is really where we, we are today in terms of delivery. So that vision getting set um, and that operational kind of governance structure, taking that vision forward has been a really nice flow. And, and we know when we need to, we can trigger that strategic board to meet again when we need to reset our vision, which is likely where we're, we're coming up to a couple of years into the program now. And then the last kind of lesson that we've drawn from this stage of the program, this mandate, is really about that sustainable funding. And, and, and there's not much more to say on top of what you've heard already, but um, dedicated funding um, without, uh, without grant ar arrangements as much as um, they, they are. Funding is all, always welcome, I say, um, while Sarah from the Home Office is on the line and we'll hear from later. <laughs> funding is always, always welcome, but the ability to do something um, ourselves modelled on our own strategy without having to um, be accountable to central government or other partners on it has been really helpful. And I know our partners have really appreciated how nimble that resourcing has been. So what I want to conclude on in this section is, um, you know, as you're thinking about the duty, the two things we'd suggest as part of a checklist that you might want to consider. One is setting out a kind of project initiation document or something that really summarizes the vision, the objectives, the resource, the governance and the structure and really sets that foundation for this work. The second area is to try and get that um, PID, as many of you will know it, approved, documented and signed off by all the partners named within the GT. Um, we've not managed to do that in full yet. We've still got ways to go, but if, what we're trying to do today is to look back and think, what could we have done slightly differently in each of these stages? So hopefully um, you can learn from, from where we've, we've not quite been able to reach ourselves. Um, so that's really the, the kind of mandate section. And I guess, you know, one of the questions I kind of have for Crest, and I'll bring in um, Crest advisory colleagues now is, you know, from your perspective, um, what do you think my joint post kind of brought to this arrangement, particularly given all your experience working in other areas? And yeah. you might want to introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, so I'm Ellie Cabell, Head of Strategy at Crest. Um, thanks, Becky. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Alison and Jim kind of quite nicely touched on it as well. But definitely from our perspective, I think having that joint post was a really good kind of starting point for something to develop into a partnership. So kind of already you weren't being led by just one organisation's kind of priorities. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really good to see, I think. Um, yeah, I think uh, James going to talk a bit more about this in a bit but but it also helped us kind of access the wider statutory partners as well which I think fed in um, and made for a really strong evidence base. Yeah, yeah so as Ellie said I'm going to talk about the next stage of work which well the next two stages of work which is all around 
designing and building the evidence base. Um, and I was lucky enough to kind of begin uh, with the program at that point. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so the first product of the evidence base is the strategic needs assessment. Um, and this document is kind of the cornerstone of a public health approach. It's key to instrumentalizing it. And it's very much a health document in origin and local authority and health colleagues will be familiar with the joint strategic needs assessments that they kind of are required to complete. And the strategic needs assessment around serious violence has to look at the scale and nature um, of serious violence. And what we mean by that is how much is there? And who does it affect? Kind of fairly simple questions, but there are a lot of data sources from across the partnership that it's important to look at. And we also recommend looking at the drivers as well. And that takes you more into the public health space. So particularly we're interested in vulnerability. So the accumulation of risk factors or lack of protective factors at population level and various um, subsets of that. So the aims of the SNA are to present the changing picture of serious violence locally, um, using quantitative and qualitative data, and also not to be forgotten is understanding the existing service response. It's very important that programs don't come in thinking they're starting with, uh, uh, with a blank check. There are things going on already. And when you're kind of making decisions about what activities to do next, it's important to have an understanding of that. I guess the biggest lesson that we have is around the definition of serious violence. Um, one of our key recommendations to the program at the start was to keep it broad. If you want to define violence by uh, that which is serious and that which isn't, it's unhelpful to kind of lump in crime categories um, uh, and not others if, if you're looking at harm. So if you're setting that level of seriousness as harm or severity, then that should include knife crime, it should include domestic abuse, it should include sexual violence and even arson, especially considering the remit of fire in the serious violence duty. So all you're doing in the SNA is you're setting a baseline understanding for decision makers. They can prioritize the type of violence after that point. It's very much supportive of localized approaches, not localized definitions. And one thing that struck us in particular working with Devon and Cornwall was the overlapping demand in some of these areas. So 40% of violence in Devon and Cornwall was domestic abuse related. So it would feel uh, it would feel unwise to not include that within the kind of broad definition of serious violence. So we would recommend a broad definition to start off with. Our next lesson is around co-production. While the strategic partners may be brought in at the start around to the RAM mandate, the um, uh, the more operational practitioners uh, are kind of key to developing strategic needs assessment, both in terms of providing you with data, but also more contextual information. We issued a call for evidence as part of this process, and that can snowball, and it's quite helpful to a uh, helpful way of engaging partners in the process. In total, we spoke to 130 people across the area, including frontline police officers and practitioners and services. A lot of this was um, contextual interviews, but there was also data requests. And these conversations, we can't recommend enough to start early. They're slightly circular with you know, us saying, what data do you have? And the other partner saying, what data do you want? And it can be quite, uh, it can be quite uh, complex, but again, it's building up that partnership understanding of what is available. And those conversations um, are kind of really important. And we analyzed 13 data, data sets as part of that SNA. So police, ambulance data, youth offending data from all four, four local authorities, probation and local authority data on, on children known to services. And I guess this really brings us into the next lesson, which is about speaking to people. And we can't advocate that enough. The data can be sparse and poor quality. There's uh, police colleagues will be quite familiar with the 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 issues around recording quality. And while those are improving, it still doesn't give you a full picture of the iceberg. So speaking to local experts, whether that's practitioners, young people, people with lived experience, it's all very worthwhile engagement. Um, you might even try a survey of certain population groups to get a sense of their own perceptions of the problem, where they feel safe or unsafe. And also when it moves on to making decisions about policy after that point, service users are in the best position to tell you what, what went well, how well they engaged in previous interventions. And it's very important, therefore, that you just don't rely on data um, in, in the strategic needs assessment. What would we do differently in future strategic needs assessments? I think as all areas um, are kind of doing their own um, and developing their own strategic needs assessment, 
I think we'll see a lot of best practice emerging. And certainly, uh, I certainly, I think there are ways in which it could be improved. And I think the definition itself will morph over time to accommodate emerging threats. So how does county lines affect individual at local areas? How do new emerging types of violence and different population groups that, that will affect? How do you then uh, kind of maneuver the definition to, to take in that into account? We're also really interested in automation. And I'm aware that a lot of public health strategic needs assessments now exist as dashboards. Uh, living maps, layering data um, onto uh, onto different uh, to different areas, and I think that will save a lot of time in the long run for local areas in developing really good insight. Is if the basic information can be automated, um, and I think that is the kind of future of creating a living strategic needs assessment. Another thing that we're really interested in in is modelling upstream demand. So the the public health approach is all about um focusing not just on enforcement which is important but also on primary and secondary levels of prevention and i think uh future strategic needs assessments should really look at how i look at the demand at those points in the system and i'll talk a little bit about trigger points later but at points at which you can identify individuals we need better understanding of how many people there are at those points and finally, it doesn't happen enough in policy, but in general, I think strategic needs assessment should try to horizon scan. And we did a little bit of this with partners that we engaged with. But what is going to happen in local areas around serious violence in the medium and long term? Um, how will the problem change, I think, is, is really important. So the key takeaways for the duty is your strategic needs assessment. That feels fairly obvious, but there will be good and bad strategic needs assessments. So there are lots of lessons to be learned about how to do that well. And as I said, co-producing yes and no with partners is a must. Giving everybody a stake in this part of the process gives them a stake in the whole process as well. Um, so that's our kind of role that we played. Um, I don't know, Becky, if you'll be producing a strategic needs assessment in years to come. So what would you do differently in the future? Yeah, I think that's I, I've been a quite key point of reflection for us. I think one of the things that um, you've touched on already is this automation piece. And I think areas will probably be in a similar place in decision making um, uh, around this to where we were uh, back in April 2020, which is, you know, a lot of the, the SNA can probably be produ produce, produced rather in-house and um, particularly within kind of policing um, performance and analysis and intel teams. Um, however, um, there's there's capacity gaps in trying to take a, a real long term uh, area wide view on these uh, various data sets that we certainly couldn't fill within the policing resource at the time. Hence, our, our kind of going out to market to bring on board a partner with the expertise to do so. And that objectivity was so helpful. But equally the same, having an external agency doing that also means that it's quite hard to make it an automated, repeatable um, tool. So I think if we were to go back, I think there would have probably been some kind of blended approach whereby perhaps um, the analyst that is attached to the programme today, um, the amazing Helen Brown, if she was in post, um, she could probably prepare and automate some of the key bits of trends that we wanted to pay attention to in the background whilst this independent document was built because nobody wants to have an SNA that lives off the shelf and, and whilst ours, ours certainly doesn't we're now in a position to try and attach that into kind of our, our, our rollout of um, more automated data across policing. I think the other thing is as well around reach into partner data and um, so we don't have a capability to bring in external partner data into the force um, in an automated way. We can do it manually. But um, Chris mentioned that they they gathered ambulance data. And I think for us, um, you know, we know that Southwest Ambulance Service, they address 50 percent of their um, of their call outs at source. Um, so there's kind of. 50% of their casework that isn't necessarily put onto systems that could be individuals who don't consent or wish to go to hospital. And, and you know, it's unviewable data, essentially, that we know we can get our hands on. And Crest were able to build that into our system for us um, and we'll build that into our SNA in a way that we wouldn't have been able to. So there's pros and cons that need to be weighed up. Um, but certainly, I think um, the dashboard kind of approach that public health are taking is where we see this work going more long term now. And 
we see the beauty of, of, of a kind of dashboard approach to try and attach really specific data points to the target cohorts that we're focusing in on the program. And we'll touch on that a bit later. Thanks, Becky. And if we move on to the next slide, we saw the strategic needs assessment as the first product, um, but not the only product. And I know that this is an envisaged in, in terms of the duty, but we think there is more that can be done to mature as a partnership. Um, and I think the first lesson there is that there's an opportunity post strategic needs assessment to begin to sustain the relationships and partnerships that you've built as part of, the, of, of developing that and to keep the momentum up and keep partners involved as opposed to brought in at certain touch points when you need them. I think co-production um, co and co-design is, is, is at the core of the successful strategy here, um, particularly as certain, uh, certain agencies can be more tricky to engage. We were lucky enough that schools and health did participate in the strategic needs assessment, which meant that when it came to um, holding partnership events that they were there and ready to to engage. Um, so what we did is we held partnership events um, to feedback the findings on the strategic needs assessment. Um, and we got a lot of interesting thoughts back. So where did they think the gaps in the knowledge were? So what would future iterations of the SNA need to look at? And we made a series of recommendations around um, knowledge and evidence base for the, the program to take forward. And it also kind of got them to horizon scan, as I mentioned before, about what do they see coming down the track. And at the time in, in Devon and Cornwall, county lines wasn't the uh, kind of main threat posed by the kind of local drug, um, in the kind of terms of the local drug markets. But they certainly thought that they saw something coming down the line in terms of more of that activity taking place in the future and being more relevant for the serious violence prevention program. Similarly, as Harvey alluded to in his opening speech, we conducted all of this research in the midst of the, in the pan, well, a little bit before, a little bit during, a little bit after the pandemic. So services were rightly worried about what the kind of hidden cost that would be, especially for young people who, um, you know, were kind of shut up in the homes, um, away from education. So again, thinking about the public health response, there was a lot there for the strategic needs assessment to consider. And I think this creates the foundation really for mature partnership arrangements where people feel like they have a meaningful stake and they're not just there to, um, to be consulted. Um, so uh, that was kind of a key next product for us. After that, we also completed um, a What Works Guide to Serious Violence. And we looked at a number of area, areas, youth violence, uh, violence against women and girls and domestic abuse. Ellie will talk a bit about performance and impact later on, but you, the option for uh, activity and commissioning decisions around that is very much root your activity in the evidence base of what works, or make sure that there's some sort of capacity within your program to evaluate, evaluate your programs themselves. There's a big conversation around demonstrating impact in terms of serious violence outcomes. There is a growing evidence base and there are a number of toolkits being developed by you know, national leagues such as the Endowment uh, Foundation and others. But you need to make sure that your local area makes a sound contribu contribution to this evidence base um, and linking outcomes to those decisions to commission activities. No one area will inevitably have the same approach when they begin to develop their strategy, hence it being a localized effort. Um, but, but hopefully, in, in monitoring outcomes robustly, best practice can be spread and areas can make better decisions um, on, as a result. Um, the, next, uh, the next thing that, the next product we produced um, was with the Social Care Institute for Excellence was a review of homicide and serious case reviews. So these are statutory um, review processes. And I think it's important to consider something like this because it shines a light not just on what the gaps are in terms of activities but what are the gaps are in terms of processes training capability activity in the in any serious fire strategy won't only focus on a program or intervention it will focus on improvements and i think what this light uh, this uh, product shone a light on was that opportunities for learning from these reviews was not being maximized they didn't provide a full picture of the perpetrators of these incidents. And we knew that multi-agencies across the system weren't, didn't have uh, adequate processes to make, uh, to take those learnings and put them in practice. 
Um, so I know that was helpful for you, Becky, certainly in sort of developing that. Okay. Yeah, it was. And I think, you know, this was probably at the, whilst I don't think we gave it the, the due attention at the time, I think because we were in this very much in developing a lot of the foundations of the programme, the Social Care Institute for Excellence really just pointed a lot of the glaring gaps that exist between um, statutory reviews and how how a review is triggered when uh, a case may apply to more than one review, how lessons are monitored, how partners are held to account, and indeed, as James touched upon, really examining the life history of the offender behind um, behind the homicide. And that put a lot of microscope on, on I guess, what we can learn from homicides. And, um, and by extension, you know, our discussion internally has gone to what can we learn about attempts? What can we learn about near misses? How do we define a near miss appropriately? And, and a lot of those questions have really led us to, to develop a homicide prevention strategy as a force, um, which the pro which myself and, and, and force colleagues put together last year. And, and I'm sure many, many of you on the call will be really, really uh, cognizant to the increases in, in homicide nationally. And um, in particularly some of the, the, the new bits of, of work taking place nationally to try and look at homicide prevention as a discipline much more fundamentally within policing. And that includes next year um, a dedicated inspection from HMIC FRS to forces on homicide prevention. And, and um, in the next couple of weeks, there will be an announcement of uh, a homicide prevention framework from a dedicated MPCC group that in it will um, point to uh, you know, a, a lot of best practice that exists around the space that we hope to mimic. So one of the things that we've agreed to do is to hire a dedicated criminal case review officer um, with the title of a serious violence reduction officer to really take on the role and the space to learn from our homicides, from our attempts and from our near misses and to try and do so in, in, in a very quick way after an incident as opposed to waiting for what is often seen as really long term statutory review processes that don't um, capitalise on what can be learned then and there when there's momentum around particular incidences. So that's really exciting um, for us. And I think that hopefully will put us in good stead around some of the national impetus on, on, that, on that agenda. Um, and there's a lot more that I hope that we can tell you about in the future as we develop that. Yeah, thanks Becky. Um, and then I think the final kind of product that we wanted to look at was kind of as I said, you have your broad view of violence with your broad definition, but you don't have a, an understanding of what you need to prioritise. So the strategy that we developed next was, okay, who do we focus on and what do we focus on? And this is where kind of number crunching, we realised that a focus on activity around under 25s um, was something that made sense for Devon and Cornwall. 40% of violence with injury was um, uh, committed by uh, offenders under the age of 25 and 41% 41, 41 of weapons possession, for example, was, was under the age of 25. And these are significant proportions and coupled with the preventative approach of the programme, we thought that this is would where impact would be greatest if we focus work in this cohort. And that's not to say that the programme won't focus on other age groups in the future. And it's not to say that it won't focus on other types of violence. This is the kind of initial approach that we looked at. So if we move on to the next slide, we then looked within the cohort of under 25s, what kind of trigger points were we looking at to, uh, to put uh, activity around? Um, and through the course of our strategic needs assessment, uh, a number of risk factors, points in the system where young people and ch children and young people under the age of 25 would be identified and picked up became really obvious and they became obvious points at which you would consider an intervention in our activity. So, the, uh, I guess, one that was particularly relevant um, in considering the overall levels of domestic abuse in Devon and Cornwall was children who are witnessing or experiencing domestic abuse in the home. And uh, at the time of the SNA, 3,000 uh, children were involved in Marrick cases, um, uh, uh, so that kind of higher risk domestic abuse. And while Marrick is the response now to those issues, to safeguarding the victims and the families, what is the response for that cohort in the future, as we know that witnessing domestic abuse is a risk factor for, for future violence. So it's really about identifying these reachable, teachable moments, as I know they're called, throughout childhood, adolescence, and early adult, adulthood, and 
therefore a basis on which to make decisions about what activities to do. One that we were really interested in was showing and we were asked to do a bit of work around was the Pathfinder program that um, that Alison mentioned, uh, so around deferred charges and deferred cautions, and, and Devon and Cornwall has led the way uh, with a number of other forces in that. And we were asked to scope out the use of personalised budgets for those for young people under the age of 25 who would be open to the Pathfinder scheme. So personalised budgets speak to money that can be drawn down uh, with that young person to enable them to unlock another layer of support beyond the referrals or services that were attached to the kind of Pathfinder intervention. And it's focused on, and we wanted to focus on longer term outcomes. So once the intervention was delivered, how do you keep them? young people on, on the path to more pro-social outcomes. Um, so there's space to be innovative in the way in which you develop your evidence base and you develop your activities. And I think Devon and Cornwall kind of led the way in allowing us to take a concept that's been used elsewhere successfully in healthcare and with care leavers and try and apply it to young people at risk or involved in serious violence. So I think I'm going to hand over to Becky and Ellie now to talk a bit more about the later phases of the programme. Yeah, thanks, James. So I'm um, very much handing over. That's basically what this uh, next phase is. It is the handover from Crest's evidence-based gathering in, back into the programme, essentially, for us to come up with our, our strategy. So, Greg, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this, this phase had an enormous amount of work uh, taking place. And, and I guess one of the very first things that, that really took place was us, um, I guess, looking at our strategy, looking at the needs assessment, and very much looking at how we operationalize and implement um, work with all those target cohorts that you just saw. Um, and also how we tie in a lot of activity that was already underway. Um, so I mentioned I, I started um, a year into the programme and actually um, in the first year of the programme and um, the commissioner and the chief and the board had already started to um, secure and invest and launch a series of activities. So we we're in a position where we had existing work taking place um, that we wanted to group under the serious violence programme, but also a whole suite of new bits of work and some funding um, that we were distributing out to local authorities for a dedicated local partnership fund to try and get activity led by partners to tie into our, our strategy too. So there was an awful lot of activity. And the first step in, in really this program was, how do we start fixing that activity together? And that's why I'll bring Ellie in to talk about our theory of change. Thanks, Becky. Yeah, fab. So yeah, um, having kind of gone through that process of developing the, the strategic needs assessment and getting to that strategy, which was really having that focus on the under 25s, there was kind of an opportunity, as you say, to develop uh, a theory of change, which would help kind of bring all partners together really around one sort of simple document that was articulating the intended impact now of the programme going forward, so now that it was a bit more developed. Um, so yes, many of you will know kind of the purpose of the theory of change is to, is to bring everyone together around that one common strategic objective um, and helping align, as Becky said, kind of existing activities and new activities to that goal. Um, so yeah, I think this is really where lessons 14 and 15 came into play. So making sure that we've waited until you had that kind of full evidence base, obviously, as we've discussed, it's kind of a constantly evolving evidence base, but having that really clear evidence base there before moving into that commissioning um, phase or kind of looking at other, other existing activities. Um, and 15 is around the kind of value add. So again, Becky kind of already alluded to it, but making sure that we, uh, everyone was kind of clear on what, what's going on in the business as usual world that's already tackling violence um, and what's gonna be the added value of um, anything new sort of activity wise um, that we develop. So the theory of change was a good starting point for that. And, and we then did this kind of um, service provision gaps analysis that I'll talk through. Um, so as I said, theory of change, as, as many of us will know, kind of starts with that unifying problem statement um, and then creates a bit of a framework for measuring um, how well activities are kind of meeting um, the, the outcomes intended. So if we move on to the next slide, Greg, we've got the kind of on a page um, theory of change here. Sorry, it might be a little bit difficult to see it all, 
But if you just look at the kind of top boxes, you can see that the aim of this is to set out what activities and, and interventions have we got currently um, funded through the program. We also looked at um, activities uh, funded by the OPCC and kind of outside of, of that as well. But the idea is that you understand how those activities can be measured. So are they going to um, give you the results that you're looking for through those key performance indicators? And that those will then give you an idea if you are working towards intermediate outcomes, which feed into your long-term outcomes, which are supporting those priorities and the overall strategic objective and vision for the program. So just to kind of highlight with an example, um, you under the kind of people priority, so we've set out this uh, key priority, which is that young people in Devon, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly are more resilient to future violence. And one of the long-term outcomes that we've worked through that would be um, helping to kind of contribute to that priority was reducing the repeat involvement of young people in serious violence, for example. Um, so breaking that down into your intermediate outcomes, you might want to do things like increase the kind of uh, proportion of young people identified as at risk of repeat involvement. You want to increase the volume of referrals. You want to increase the um, level of engagement of young people in those services. So then you can kind of look at how you might measure those and then, um, and then kind of looking at it the other way around, what activities do you currently have that are gonna help you meet those intermediate um, outcomes? So that's the kind of very whistle-stop tour. I think we are, we're sharing the slides afterwards, I think. So you can kind of have a look through it in a bit more detail, but um, there's lots on there, but the idea is that it is really clearly articulate, articulating the overall vision and helping understand how individual activities are aligned with that overall vision. Um, so I think if you just go back to the previous slide, Greg, thank you, just to kind of touch on the gaps analysis, which was formed um, through kind of bringing together the, the strategy, the strategic needs assessment, the evidence, um, kind of best practice evidence guide that James mentioned, and then finally the theory of change and understanding kind of the existing activities in Devon and Cornwall. Um, and how, how they were kind of mapped against all of those things. Um, I won't hammer the point home too much because I think, I think we've kind of already implied it, but the, the key point here was there is already lots of work going on. We want to know what is that doing and what could the program do that will kind of either tweak those existing services to kind of match what we learned through the strategic needs assessment better or provide a kind of additional service and um, so we did the gaps analysis by sort of asking ourselves um six key questions so first of all thinking about things we learned in the strategic needs assessment does the activity target a particular subset of violence so james mentioned domestic abuse being a kind of core subset of violence does the intervention or activity kind of target a specific um subset there we looked at does it target a specific driver um, does it target one or more of the cohorts that James was mentioning? Um, and then finally, does it, sorry, not finally, almost finally, does the um, intervention target a particular level? So um, the kind of public health approach suggests that you want to have a kind of mix of interventions from primary to tertiary. So are your kind of range of interventions covering um, also a, a range of levels in terms of primary through to tertiary? Um, and then looking at does it align with best practice and does it align with that theory of change? So are the activities that are already happening already contributing to those um, intermediate and long term outcomes that we identified? Um, so with those gaps in mind, I think that was then kind of the point at which you, you really launched the local partnership fund. So, yes, I'll let you hand over to talk about that. Perfect segue back. And um, so. <laughs> Um, as I've mentioned, um, with the funding of a million pounds a year that the commissioner and um, assigned to the programme and um, jointly with the force as well, we were able to um, put out a, uh, a weighted um, amount of, of funding to each local authority. And in return, we asked for them to co-design uh, a series of projects um, that they wanted to do um, based on meeting our strategy, but also the gaps that we'd identified. And one of the big gaps um, at this stage of the programme was in the tertiary landscape in terms of doing one-on-one -on -one work directly with those at risk. 
um, in a more pronounced way versus um, those who are perhaps um, at the beginning of a risk profile who are um, maybe being excluded from school um, and, and other such kind of more lower down um, parts of, um, of the risk spectrum. And, and that local partnership fund um, went out to all local authorities. We also, as part of that, gave um, a, a small amount of investment to each community safety partnership. And we used two um, weightings to decide on how to distribute the funding. One was the population of under 25s in each of the local authority areas. And the second was um, the, the population rate of violence per head uh, calculated and um, using our definition. So that was really nice for us to be able to um, to distribute something to, to all, but also to make sure that it was pronounced and, and favoring those where uh, the risk profile was higher. And, and that process was, when I say co-designed, it was the three of us in my team with each local authority going through a couple of scoping workshops to really try and finite down what target groups they wanted to work with and why, how they were gonna do so and um, over a two year period. And, and where we thought there was, um, I guess, I, the main thing with, with the funding was we wanted to try and be bold and do things that couldn't be done elsewhere. And I'll talk about one of the examples that Cornwall are doing around children and um, whose parents are in prison as a really interesting example of a cohort that's um, kind of hidden, uh, quite hidden harm that we know um, isn't really a priority for any other agenda. And I think that's really the big lesson for us from this from this phase of work was you know how do we operationalize our strategy how do we get under the car bonnet how do we really leverage the the different uh, vehicles and touch points that we have as a program through our partners but also through us directly and um, and how can we avoid this kind of projectitis this let's do a bit of this and a bit of that and we were very conscious that I would, I would, you know, be very um, upfront in saying I think quite often prevention and public health, in particularly public health oriented prevention, is misinterpreted as universal kind of orientated activity, um, resilience building, education, training, things that aren't necessarily tangibly making a measurable difference to the lives of someone. So we're really trying to push partners to 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 look further. And um, more, you know, to, to basically cover a, a spectrum of tertiary, secondary, and primary interventions, and not just do school-facing work, which is often sometimes where prevention um, ends up focusing. Um, so we're able to really use this phase to look at directly attributable activity that the program started and not simply measure everything and there's a real danger with the broad definition of serious violence that we've used that all of a sudden we're going to start measuring every aspect of the forces business as usual work in, in tackling violence every partner's ability to work with a you know with a family where domestic violence is taking place we don't we can't monitor everything so what do we specifically pull out and, and pronounce in a way that we can monitor and, and that uh, was really central to this work and um, I think just to pull out a couple of the lessons maybe that we've not mentioned so far I think one element is really around um being really cognizant of who has been around the table so I think at this point I realized we'd been heavily embedded with our strategic kind of partners and strategic executive members within the force and the OPCC but what that cost us perhaps was um, taking a little longer for the programme to see where we could latch into work already underway, particularly within the force. And um, so really getting into the detail of, you know, what is the force's contribution to policing young people? What, what engagement does the force have in schools? How are we engaging with safeguarding partners and, and really getting quite focused in on, on those services and looking at where they can be tweaked. And that was quite a strong part of this work. Um, and then I'd also say um, there's a certain element of um, making sure that we're, uh, when we are doing commissioning with the third sector, making sure that we're bringing them into the fold. So this avoiding the helicopter commissioning is also about recognising that if we're going to be working as we do with a third sector who's doing work with, with children on the verge of exclusion, that they're embedded within the local authority and safeguarding processes that we're supporting and unblocking any any um, barriers that they may face in engaging with policing colleagues that we're really looking at that value add from a program from a force and how we're locking in partners into that and not just letting the third sector and particularly sit and operate in a silo 
which is often um, where I think commissioning can go wrong. Um, so uh, that's, that's very much this large phase. So we'll move on to just showing you a few examples of what was in this response strategy and three specific bits of work um, that are taking place. So uh, Greg, if you can put on the next slide, please. Uh, maybe the one after that. Here we go. Um, so just to introduce, um, I guess, what our response kind of looks like in practice. So um, given that COVID happened in the first year of the programme, we're at a position now where we've got 35 live projects up and running across the peninsula um, and seven in development at the moment. What that looks like in terms of where the efforts led from, six of them are, are kind of traditional commissioning. So they're projects that were are, um, uh, funded out via the OPCC and managed in, in a traditional way. Eight projects are police-led, and I'll show you an example of them, but they're things that we're revising and changing and resourcing internally as a force. And then 21 are partnership-led projects where we're not the lead delivery partner, but we're a, a contributor. And, and collectively, those programmes to date have reached 1,400 young people and around 140 parents and, and wider family members. If you can go to the next slide, please. And just to pull out three examples of, of these projects, uh, one is around, um, if we start at the top in blue, a police-led activity, um, law enforcement in public health, LEF. Um, so this is known as LEF Link, and I, and I will be delighted to talk to other forces um, in particular who might be interested, but essentially it's a public health signposting tool, and it's designed for frontline policing. And we started a pilot in, in Plymouth um, before we roll it out across the peninsula. But essentially, this is a, an app on your phone and a web-based um, uh, website you can, um, that any member of the public and partner agencies can also view. And it lists harms and it lists services locally and nationally that are available to meet those harms. So an example, um, and what we're, we're seeing this being used for locally in the pilot in Plymouth, is if you've got a neighbourhood cop who's um, on patrol and they come across a member of the public who's homeless, they're able to pull up their, um, their handset and get both a uh, list of referrals um, that they could make locally and details of local services that they could pass on to that person or indeed make a phone call on their behalf. And um, they also get um, some suggested uh, very brief intervention points to discuss. So those are things around us, what you should ask, what, how you can assist and what you can advise. And that's really trying to embed this public health tool and um, not just the cultural change and the mindset, but the tool in the pocket of every cop. So they're able to take on those wider um, services and, and signpost to partners. And we also have, and, and I'd love to go into it, but I'm conscious of time, um, restorative justice family workers who are taking the traditional RJ model that's used um, around um, crime and, and managing, um, uh, I guess, uh, a process between the person harmed and the harmer but they're also now working with the wider families of the harmer and the harmed and they're able to provide a wraparound support to get to the root cause quite frequently of where conflict can arise from and then we'll also have um uh, we also have a project led by Cornwall and that Simon Mould um, will soon come on to talk a little bit about, which is around working with children affected by parental imprisonment. And that's very much a needs analysis. Where can we identify these children whose parents are in prison? What's the best point at which we can trigger a referral process? What should that referral process entail? So it's scoping in its first few months with a view that a support model is created. So that's just some of the 35 odd projects that are taking place and, and you know, we could talk all day on those. Um, if we can move on to uh, the final uh, slide, please. Um, and looking to the future is also ironically looking to the past. So it's retreading our steps. Um, so this is where we are today in, in, in essence. So now we're back to surveillance again. We've got a range of work taking place, but we know we now need to re-collaborate and look back at that project initiation document. Is it doing what we want it to do? Have we got the right cohorts? What's emerged in the last two years that we're missing? And there are a number of cohorts that have popped up of interest to us um, just recently in the last couple of days young carers, um, thinking about uh, stop and search and youth disproportionality, thinking about knife carriers, um, and particularly under 25s uh, who are knife carriers, and the list goes on. So that's what we're essentially moving into now is kind of consolidation and refinement. 
And a lot of this phase in green on the screen, you can see this kind of focus on full strategic improvements. And, and that's really harking back to, as part of our strategic needs assessment, the, the 145 odd pages of, of, of delight that Crest built for us. There is so much in there that we haven't even had a chance to pick up on that we know are still gaps. And a lot of that relates to operational improvements and the forced and thinking about things like our vulnerability assessment tools that we use. Are they accurate? How can we improve and leverage things like Op and Compass, the trigger um, to schools and the notification around when a young person is um, an incident of DA has been involved in a, a child's home. Um, and many of you will use that process. There's a lot of scope to, to improve that um, as part of our, our longer term public health approach to violence prevention. Um, so now going forward, we're really looking at that strategic refresh and we're looking at how we need to adapt the program to to essentially folding in the serious violence duty, and in particularly the three reduction measures that are really at the heart of the duty around reducing homicide, around reducing hospital admissions for knife and weapons and incidences of the kind. So those things uh, are now starting to come much more into the fold and scope of the programme in a way that maybe they wouldn't have been at the beginning. And also, you know, very much looking ahead as our partners catch up and start considering what budget, what processes they may want to refine um, as their response to the duty, we're now in a really good position to start having those strategic uh, discussions around future commissioning. And we've already got a, a variety of different co-commissioned work taking place around mental health treatment services for those under Pathfinder, uh, through to a substance misuse worker dedicated to work with young people, co-funded from the OPCC's budget, and Torbay Council's public health team. So there's some really interesting models already emerging, but you know, there's a lot, lot more to do. And I think we've got the right foundation to build on. Um, so I'll, I'll pause and, and kind of conclude there, Harvey, and pass back to yourself. Thank you, Becky. Um, a really good overview of, of the programme and, and the journey that you've been on. I wonder if before we move to our next speaker, um, whether whether you and, and Crest colleagues might say a few words about the serious violence duty um, and how the work you've done has helped you to to think about that duty or how the duty might change uh, some of your some of your work in Devon and Cornwall. Yeah, thanks, Harvey. I think there's so certainly the reduction measures that are in place in the duty and um, I think building them into our program much more fundamentally is a, is a shift that we're seeing and and so I guess that that kind of takes what is a, a public health by origin design to being a bit more sharper and a bit more refined and focused on on what are seen as kind of problems here and now and actually we don't whilst those issues aren't necessarily um the driving force of uh, of the motivation behind our work in our area they will be much more pronounced in other areas in the country and um, I think one of the big things is around governance so how we structure uh, uh, the geography of this of, of the region and the, the, the variety of partners underneath that into something that's strategic and, and assure you know provides accountability and assurance for all partners named in the duty and we haven't quite quite got that right yet but I'd say the ultimate lesson um, for us is Policing leading this is a really natural place to be in, and there is no lead agency listed in the duty. Um, so somebody has to step into that. And I think, um, and we hope that partners have been really grateful for the joint policing collaboration between the APCC and the force in, in providing that foundation and that strategic leadership and facilitation on the agenda and on the duty as it comes in. Um, and I think that's been the big lesson for us. Without that, I'm not too sure we'd have a unified approach. Um, and I don't think we'd have any of the same objectives set to bring partners on a, on a journey together. In terms of the duty, I think the, the issue here is that all agencies start with their own priorities locally and nationally. And the right convener can solve a lot of that, bringing the right people around the table. And Becky certainly has been at the forefront of that in Devon and Cornwall, but that doesn't solve everything in terms of that multi-year roadmap towards system change, the strategic point around embedding serious violence outcomes in your priorities. And I think the question at a national level is what level of 
I guess, cross-departmental alignment there needs to be, and therefore within each department, clear direction for duty partners on what they need to do, and therefore as well, consideration for what funds need to be available to those partners to commission in line with the serious violence priorities. So that's, I guess, my big reflection from the work. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, I think the only thing I would add, I guess, is um, I think the requirement to kind of come together and understand sort of the, the scale and nature of serious violence locally uh, across all partners offers a massive opportunity around that at building the evidence base together as well. So I think it's a I guess thinking about the kind of impact measurement that we talked about um, and how the theory of change process kind of helps set that out, really making sure that areas are focusing as much on the, the sort of evaluation um, point as well as kind of developing those interventions in line with, um, with what we already know works and kind of the, the local needs, but really thinking about contributing to the, the evidence base nationally as well and kind of bringing all the partner data together um, offers a massive opportunity, I think, to do that. Thank you, Ellie. Okay, um, I'm going to hand over now to Simon Mould, who is the head of the Resilient, Resilient Communities and chair of the Safer Cornwall Partnership. And uh, Simon's going to talk a bit about uh, the work that Cornwall have done as part of this programme. Simon. Yeah, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks very much for the, for the time. And uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak and share our experience. <clears throat> and moreover, just build this uh, ongoing relationship really of, um, of, of best practice. Um, also just wanted to say a huge thank you to our Police and Crime Commissioner for the recognition of the role of community safety partnerships in what is clearly a very uh, system response in the way in which we need to collectively come together to look at how we can tackle serious violence. So I do hope I'll be able to build on some of the comments from other colleagues who have already spoken. Uh, I don't know if I will be able to help under the bonnet uh, discussion, so um, don't know if I've ever been a good mechanic, but we'll see uh, how I can take that forward for you. So I think one of the things I would pick up just before we talk is I think it was really important to acknowledge um, a, that system approach and how we all come together and understand the roles that we have to play. And also, I think what's been really important coming through this discussions this morning is that real clear evidence base and uh, understanding local place and what we have and how we look to understand that we don't duplicate, but instead look for the gaps and overlaps and how we then collectively work together on that. So um, I think from a Cornwall perspective, uh, obviously uh, acknowledging Cornwall wasn't identified as a violence reduction unit area um did bring some additional challenges without that investment which has been touched upon and i suspect just for context for those that may not know obviously with cornwall it is generally a safe and lower crime area uh, but we do see some concerning trends uh, across the duchy with youth violence and disorder and in some of our larger towns along the um, continued impact of county lines and drug related uh, crime so clearly one of the key areas of focus of the partnership has always been prevention and prevention being key. Uh, as touched upon by, by um, other colleagues as well this morning, domestic abuse within Cornwall is seen as one of those major drivers of serious violence here. Uh, however, um, it is a key factor in pushing up our local rates of violence above the average for similar areas nationally. So again, we uh, really welcome the government seeing that uh, domestic abuse and sexual offences would be included within um, the serious violence duty. So I suppose just as a, 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 a talk through of how we responded to the announcement of the duty and sort of try to build it through. Um, so as a community safety partnership, uh, Safer Cornwall submitted a multi-agency response to the initial Home Office consultation uh, back in 2009 to try and help shape that duty. We also reviewed the Safer Cornwall partnership and felt that that was best place to take the lead locally uh, on the duty and started to prepare for that accordingly. And some of the things that we looked at, firstly, we reviewed the membership of the partnership to ensure it's fit for purpose to start on that duty. So we had included and, and, and stretched the uh, membership. So as well as having um, the normal responsible local authorities, uh, we ensured that we got all directorates from the council. Uh, there we've got elected, elected members from our European scrutiny for both neighbourhoods, health and adult social care. Um, we had the partnership superintendent uh, join. We've got the commissioning and partnership manager from criminal justice. 
Um, we've already been working extremely well with um, the independent chairs for both the Safeguarding Children's Partnership and also our Adults uh, Safeguarding uh, Partnership. We've brought in um, the Chief Exec from the Cornwall Volunteer Sector, uh, representation from DWP. Uh, also, we've called through uh, the um, CALC, the Cornwall Association of Local Councils, so ensuring that we have our 213 town and parish councils represented, and also the Chief Exec of the Local Enterprise Partnership, Inclusion Cornwall, and representation from Public Health England as well, so the Programme Manager for Health and Wellbeing. So we, we definitely increased that membership to ensure that we've got that wider system conversation when we were moving forward. Uh, we also looked and agreed a scope of our local definition of serious, serious violence, building underneath that that had been set by the SBPP. And we also reviewed all of our existing need assessments. So we have a uh, suite of strategic uh, needs assessments that underpin uh, all of the work that we did through the partnership, as well as a range of strategies to look at how they could be used to meet those elements. So again, very much rather than duplicating what we already have and where are the gaps and how we can do that. We really welcome the announcement uh, at the time that the PCC and police have established the Serious Violence Prevention Programme back in 2020, and uh, we collaborated and supported the Peninsula Programme as it both developed um, and moved forward. So with regards to the Peninsula Programme and what it's provided, um, I think it would be no surprise as hopefully you've got a, an influence that uh, we really welcome the evidence-led approach um, that the SBPP uh, took. It provided a very clear framework uh, within which to place our local response to youth violence alongside our complementary work streams under our partnership plan to tackle domestic abuse and sexual violence and uh, wider public place and alcohol-related violence. So I think that really sort of created that framework for us to start that conversation and make sure we were getting those focuses through. And so that some of the benefits I think that we pulled through, A was that high level strategic needs assessment, which gave that peninsula view of serious violence, um, its features and risk factors, and also pulled in that uh, robust national research. And what that then enabled us to do was to utilize that uh, to undertake our own strategic assessment uh, so more of a deep dive, if you will, into the Cornwall issues uh, to help make sure we could get under the root causes and really ensure that we maximised and focused our attentions to best. So that uh, cohesive uh, framework for change around that specific target group of under 25s um, was really important for us and it gave us that real strong emphasis on prevention. Um, it also enabled us to look at uh, what works and best practice, both locally and further afield, to inform our local responses. Uh, it also gave us the opportunity to look at that direct commissioning and investment in local projects, uh, which I'll come on to um, later, and also provided that overarching monitoring and evaluation. So again, not only did we have the evidence base, but it also then made when we were working through that, we had very clear evaluation criteria and looked at how we could ensure that we could support and feedback um, on, on those pieces. So um, with regards to the SBPP programme, um, uh, we'd already established a multi-agency strategy and system approach to tackling domestic abuse and sexual uh, violence. That has been recognised as a, um, uh, nationally uh, for a number of key areas, including our bystander training and commissioning for men who have experienced abuse. And the preferred scope for Cornwall with this particular programme was to focus our funding on preventing youth violence, as we did really see that we've got a gap there, and that's an area that we wanted to focus on. So the main area of investment which was touched on was our uh, CAPI uh, project, and that was a, a pilot of uh, a referral pathway and support package for children and young people affected by parents in prison, uh, parental imprisonment which also will deliver improved uh, identification of affected families through sharing partnership data. Um, so this was a service that we didn't currently provide in Cornwall, uh, and we also accepted as being a gap in the way in which we support uh, children nat nationally uh, and a feature of Hidden Heart. So that was our key area of um, focus through there. Um, the project had strong support also through our voluntary sector uh, partners, and we're currently establishing an exciting new partnership with Children Heard and Seen, who are the uh, specialist charity currently providing uh, this service in the UK. 
So with regards to the CAPI project, if I just sort of teased out what that will provide. So firstly, it will provide accredited training and resources to enable us to build local skills and capacity in the specialist area. It will enable us to test a range of pathways to identify children and families needing help, as there's no pre-existing uh, mechanism to do that. And it will also support innovation and creative partnership working. So looking at how we work with probation, schools, children's services, police, voluntary sector uh, engaged to look at how we can build that learning across. Uh, we've also, with the additional funding, we're also uh, piloting a co-designed youth violence reduction project uh, with young people in a defined geographical area uh, for Bodmin for this pilot, with an aim to uh, provide a model for rolling out to other places in Cornwall. And then, uh, as mentioned earlier, we're also looking at a piece of work to map existing services and initiatives that currently support young people aged between 16 and 24 involved in or at risk of violence. And we'll follow that up with a pilot initiative in year two to meet the priority needs. So from a Cornwall perspective, the things that we have really chimed well, I think, was A, that extra leverage and visibility of violence as a priority for Cornwall. Um, so really pleased that that's now reflected in the Cornwall Council's business plan under our vibrant, safe, supportive communities. Uh, it enabled us to uh, have a clear line in our new Safer Cornwall Partnership Plan which is our multi-agency statutory partnership. It also meant that we could set out our long-term ambition to tackle violence in the Cornwall Plan 2050, which is uh, wider than the council, bringing in key, key partners. And it also meant that we could have that uh, full multi-agency sign-up and accountability through the SVPP Concordia. So we could really push that forward and make sure that one went through. Also, I think as well as having that clear framework, it also provided that flexibility to respond to the peninsula strategy and priorities in a way that best meets Cornwall's needs and profile alongside our existing strategies and plans. So it didn't feel like it was an imposed top down, but instead, because we've got the intelligence base and the framework, we were able to analyze and work together to see what areas we could best focus on at a local way and which areas we could fully support from a peninsula way. So we weren't duplicating and in fact, actually magnifying and ensuring that we were working um, uh, collectively together to maximize our resources to best effect. So hopefully colleagues that just gave you a very a quick uh, overview from a Cornwall perspective. Um, we are extremely supportive of the approach that this has undertaken and really feel that the partnership uh, way in which the conversations have, have gone on the flexibility at a local uh, basis and recognition that partnerships may already have um, plans in place, strategies in place that enable us to do that. And instead of saying that we needed to do something different, look at how we could align those to maximize those opportunities has been really welcome. Um, and be delighted to share uh, as we move forward with the Cathy, how that works. And of course, in the true spirit of learning, welcome observations and if anybody else has got some wonderful things happening uh the opportunity to bring those together so thank you and uh, hopefully harvey that uh, gives you a quick summary that's really helpful thank you simon and uh, a really good overview um if i could now just bring in uh, sarah featherstone from the home office sarah is a senior policy advisor uh, on serious violence and is the lead policy lead on the serious violence duty um, so uh, really delighted to have her here today um, and I'm sure lots of you will be really interested in what she's got to say from a national perspective. Sarah, could I invite you just to, to give some of your reflections on, on some of the work you've heard about in Devon and Cornwall and, and maybe um, some of the implications in terms of thinking about uh, other areas that might be preparing for the GT? Thanks. Yeah, certainly. And yeah, thanks very much for inviting me to come speak to you today. Um, I suppose really my reflections on what Devon and Cornwall have done so far. Um, I think it's really good to hear that local partners have taken control of serious violence issues when they were identified and they realised it was becoming an issue rather than actually waiting for central government to tell them to do it. Um, you've certainly not been complacent that Devon and Cornwall was a low crime area so you didn't have to do anything so I think that's a really positive first step. Um, you've adopted a public health approach, um, work, working across traditional work boundaries to come up 
on long-term solutions, focusing particularly on prevention and early intervention, which we know is key to the success of, of, of local existing in using existing partnerships that work for you rather than coming up with something new and these relationships seem to be quite developed well developed across Devon and Cornwall um, these are all the things that as I think other speakers have said that the serious violence um, I do realize though that the delivery landscape is very complex for people and I'm pleased to hear that you've been trying to look at the work you were doing on serious violence alongside other statutory and non-statutory requirements. I do constantly evolve in and will continue to do so with new requirements such as those under the victims legislation continuing to be introduced. Um, James spoke briefly about the definition for serious violence, um, which I know is, is sort of been a subject for discussion, um, both through the parliament parliamentary stages of the legislation and beyond. As it was said, the duty is intentionally flexible, um, leaving the definition for what serious violence should look like um, flexible, although at the later stages of the legislation's passage, um, we introduced a government amendment, which some of you might be aware of, um, to make it clearer that domestic abuse and sexual offences must be considered as part of the local assessment of the serious violence issue. It seems to be something that you're doing already, working closely with domestic violence work streams across the area, but not seeking to duplicate existing work, so building on what's already happening, really. Um, so just going on to the duty, it will be requiring all areas in England and Wales to pre prevent and reduce serious violence, and it will be a legal requirement. So partners will have to work together to share data and intelligence. You're already doing that, to carry out a strategic needs assessment, which you're already doing, and developing a strategy to address these issues, including putting appropriate interventions in place. Just, just as a reminder, really, those subject to the duty are police, local authorities, youth offending teams, probation, fire and rescue and health authority, education and prison and youth custody institutions will be under a separate duty to cooperate with the main duty holders when asked to. And they will need to be consulted on both the strategic needs assessment and the strategy. Other organisations uh, such as the voluntary sector, local businesses, national organisations, which it sounds like you're working with already, um, will also be able to collaborate with the duty holders on the same basis, but these bodies are not subject to the duty themselves. I think probably a, a, a sort of a, a sense from me is you might want to reflect on the organisations um, that who are authorities under the duty and determine whether in De Devon and Cornwall you have all the right people around the table. It sounds like you've got most of those there, but there may be some gaps. Uh, I think it's worth bearing in mind that everyone has something unique to bring to the discussion. And, you know, I just, just looking at some of the question and answers, um, people were mentioning the involvement of housing, um, which I know seems to be a particular sort of salient issue at the moment with the sort of instances of cuckooing um, and you know the ability to move people into alternative accommodation. So if you're not involved in housing already, you might want to consider that. And somebody also mentioned, although they would come under health authorities, the involvement of community midwives, who apparently have some really useful intelligence that it might be worth you drawing on. Um, so also through the duty, we're encouraging police and crime commissioners to become the lead convener for the duty, even though, again, they themselves are not subject to the duty. It seems that Devon and Cornwall, um, and with the support of Becky, have already introduced this model with the PCC being heavily involved in developing the current strategy. Um, we would expect PCCs to provide assistance with the strategy, as well as monitoring and implement the implementation of the strategy in order to report this to the Secretary of State, so the Home Secretary. 
Um, just, just worth you being aware, there is some teeth to the duty in order to ensure local areas are fulfilling its requirement. But as a first point port of call, we would envisage local partners would sort out any issues with delivery themselves. And only as a last resort, the PCC could instigate a Secretary of State direction. What this means in sort of simple language is that the agency not complying with the requirements of the duty can be told to do, the, do so through the courts. Um, but as I was saying, we would much prefer local partners to collaborate closely to avoid this path. So just going on briefly to what we are doing in the Home Office, um, as some of you might be aware, we held a statutory government consultation on our statutory guidance to support the duty. That was during uh, June and July. And we're currently analysing the responses to this. And we aim to publish a final version of this towards the end of this year. Just to give you a flavour for some of the things that people raise through the consultation, and some of these have been discussed uh, at this session, um, people felt that we should make the following things clearer in the final version of the guidance. So there was a discussion about the role of PCCs under the duty and just being a bit more explicit about the role that we expect them to take, take on. Um, and somebody else mentioned this sort of local accountability, governance structures, including by community safety partnerships, um, because alongside the duty legislation, we're also making some amendments to the Crime and Disorder Act, which in account will mean that uh, community safety partnerships have to have a serious violence strategy in place. Um, even if they're not leading that, leading that work, they need to be uh, reassured that, that that work is happening in their local area. And as it was already discussed, the inclusion of domestic abuse and sexual offences under the duty. So th those are areas alongside others that we plan to look at in the revised version of the guidance. So just, just talking briefly about um, commencement, we plan to commence the duty provisions. Um, as some of you were aware, they were included in the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act. So it's a massive piece of legislation which received royal assent in April this year. Um, but we are planning to commence the duty provisions early next year, date yet to be determined. Um, and, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, some of these things are, are subject to change, but that's certainly our plans at the moment. Alongside commencement, there will be various offers of support um, from the Home Office to local areas, um, which they'll be able to benefit from. So that's in those in VRU areas and non-VRU areas. Um, we'll be confirming these arrangements once we've published the guidance and are looking towards commencement of the provisions. Um, once we commence the provisions, uh, local areas will need to publish their strategies within a year of commencement. Um, so obviously, you know, if you're in a position to publish that before the year, that's absolutely fine. Um, and it should be, we're suggesting in the statutory guidance that the uh, strategy should be reviewed, reviewed at least every year. Um, but of course, you know, if there are significant changes in your local area that need to be reflected sooner, please review them sooner. Um, we, it seems to me that, that Devon and Cornwall have done some really good groundwork on, on this, which I'm sure they will continue to develop once the duty is commenced. And I'm certainly impressed by your ability to get in additional funding to do this work too. As I think a number of the other speakers said, that is key. There will be some Home Office funding for all local areas to comply with the duty. However, I think that the early work that you've done in Devon and Cornwall will stand you in good stead. Um, and I commend your commitment to do this as a partnership. So I think that's probably all I, I want to say at the moment. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. And, and really helpful to have that, uh, to have that overview of the legislation and the timings around the duty uh, and and your reflections on, on the work that Devon and Cornwall have done. Right, we've got um, about 25 minutes still um, until the end of the webinar, and we've got some fantastic questions that have come in. Please do keep submitting them, and we'll try and get as many as we can in to our panellists. 
Um, the, I, I'm just going to pick a few, uh, bec- uh, some of the some of the some most interesting ones that I've I've spotted. Um, let's start with George Hoskins, who, um, if it's the same George Hoskins who's the founder of the Wave Trust, uh, it, that's that's fantastic. As Wave Trust are a, a major player in in the world of prevention and early intervention, and, and know an enormous amount about violence prevention. And George asks about he says that repeated research has shown investment in primary prevention produces the highest level of payback. Um, yet most public investment goes into tertiary prevention. What is Devon and Cornwall planning for primary prevention of serious violence? And I don't know, Becky, if you want to have a stab at that one, uh, because you you were talking about uh, some of this earlier on. Yeah, thanks. And and George, excellent question. And I think, um, uh, and I think I'm going to probably put you a question back, um, which is whose job is it to do and that real primary prevention. And I think that's part of the, the kind of complexity of limited resources and huge demand and supply. So for instance, you know, from, a, from the policing funding that we've had, we've been encouraging partners to choose how they want to address their funding locally. And I think because of the current climate, a lot of people are focusing in on trying to put in place the most um, targeted work they can with populations to try and limit the risks that they might be exposed to. So an example would be, for instance, um, turning corners, it's been mentioned quite a lot so far. So that's got kind of three strands to it. One that really focuses on year six students moving on up into secondary school. And but the year six students already experience already demonstrating and displaying behavioral challenges within the school environment. So it is pre-violence um, in, in that sense. But it's not it's not as far upstream as I know Waves work would urge us to go. And I think that's part of the contribution. And I know there's another question that came through around where do, where does local authority public health come in? And this is where I think local authority public health bodies come in. A lot of our work is trying to prevent people from growing increasing risks and making sure that when they are exposed to harm that we're putting in all the protective factors we can around them. And there is a lot, there is a lot more um, further upstream that we can go on that, that we'd urge partners to do. But I, I do think that it always comes down to supply and demand in terms of resources. And I think this is where a bit of a closer bit of modeling work with public health over the next few years of the program will really help us to try and influence, which is the role I think that, that the OPCC and the force can do is influence partners to look at the earliest possible intervention and particularly in the under fives, which is obviously cohorts that's policing. We hope not to not to encounter too much. Um, and sadly, we probably encounter um, a lot more than we wish. Um, so maybe not quite the perfect answer. And I don't know if Alison, you, you want to contribute anything to that as well. Uh, I do. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. I, I think for, for us, what's quite interesting, and this is from a politician's perspective, one of the things we've had to learn through this programme is strategic patience. Now, Be- Becky's been at the, you know, the end of the chief and I saying, you know, we want action, action, action. And that is what leads you to targeting those groups of the today, of the here and now, of those who are most at risk right now. And, and I think we've got a challenge to get us to move to um, that really early prevention. I know through Waves Trust, you've come up with almost a top 10 uh, age group in which you can have the maximum intervention with those young people. And that's from pregnancy all the way um, through up to about, I think, 10 or 11 year olds. Um, so I think for us, we've got a challenge because politicians want to see results and the government wants to see results. And it's been really hard through this program to hold the line of not getting distracted by an immediate bit of violence that's happened in our patch. And and I think, you know, because the policing will respond to that, that there is an immediate police response to a serious violence incident in our patch. Um, and, And so we have left the police to deal with those and we've left partners to deal with those while we try and learn to have patience to look at how we are doing long-term change in our community. It's been really hard. And that's why we've got a little bit of mix and match in some of our commissioning, because we wanted some immediate results versus stuff we know we won't see beyond our own term of office or our own professional careers. So we are aware we need to be looking at a 10 to 15 year result window. We're, We're not there yet. 
we're not at that point yet because it's so difficult to show delivery, especially as this is funded by council taxpayers. So our community are funding a million pounds out of their council tax every year at the moment in order to support this program. So they're going to want to see results quick as well. And I think uh, that's the challenge. I'd say that's a challenge for us. The, the only thing I, I will add, though, is we had obviously the key mass shooting happen whilst we had this program established and we did roll our sleeves up and we actually if we didn't have this program in place we wouldn't have done i believe um a, such an excellent response to either draw down funding from government to, to assist and be ready to go with things that we thought would really help and so i suppose it's about get be always being ready isn't it as a, as a as an area to be able to respond to some very serious challenges that you have but like i said holding that line between an operational issue that's happened today and what we're actually trying to achieve for the long term is tricky. That's a great answer, Alison and, and, and Becky. And I wonder if I could just draw you to another question or, or a couple of questions from Councillor Barrand, who, who actually asks about a, a, a live issue. He talks about a, a rise of knife, knife attacks in Torbay, uh, and he's concerned about serious violence and intimidation linked to county lines drug activity and and asks about what the program can offer in and maybe is is this an example where you need to have that strategic patience and you you and you you almost let the 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 real time trends uh, be be a policing issue and you put in place programs that can that can make a difference over the longer term or do you think there's a role for the program to flex and adapt to some of those some of the kind of evolution of serious violence that you're seeing in Devon and Cornwall. I'll just quickly start, Becky, just to say, so Torbay in particular on Friday had a serious stabbing of a 15 year old. And, um, you know, it, our plan is to get to the point where that 15 year old wouldn't have been stabbed. And if we don't spend the time and the effort and the investment in trying to stop that happening, we'll have another 15 year old stab next year and another 15 year old stab the following year. Uh, and we can't just keep reacting to it because that's what's happening at the moment. I think too much reactive policing. Policing are great in a crisis and they are fantastic at reacting when something's happened. But we've got to help move that thinking forward. And we're, we're, like I say, we're not there yet, but we are we are on our journey to getting there. And it's really hard to, to hold the line. And yeah, so, Becky, you've identified some issues with Torbay actually through what, our work. So you might want to just raise those as well. Yeah, I think just to say, um, it's it's really interesting, Torbay and Plymouth are, um, are two of our hotspot areas for violence in the peninsula. We're really level pegging um, up until the point in which the strategic needs assessment concluded. And, and since that, um, we've been seeing some quite um, distinct increases in Torbay and, and Plymouth kind of stabilising, which is kind of interesting at how quickly that picture of, you know, two areas that we very much say are both requiring dedicated resources now starting to, to move away from one another. And that's motivated by a whole heap of public health data sets around deprivation, but also um, also violent crime. And um, I, I hadn't heard, um, I'd obviously heard about the stabbing, but I think one of the things um, in, that's really interesting around knife crime, and, and, and I think Alison's right in terms of, whilst we're not reacting, over the last fortnight, actually, I've been working really closely with the course thematic lead for knife crime to try and really professionalise how that portfolio runs. And just a couple of examples within that. One is that there's a tool that we use um, within schools where there has been an incident um, of a, a carrying either of a knife or a sharp object, and that's deployed by the force into specific schools as a result of an incident taking place. That tool's not been evaluated. We don't really know how that tool's being deployed. That's the professionalization that this program's doing. It's saying, what have we got? Um, not, not what should we do today? It's doing that stock take. What have we got? Is it working? How can we get an evidence base? And we'll fund an evaluation of that to see if it is a worthwhile tool. And, and similarly, there's also a bit of a risk around life crime that many of you will know from a, a kind of stratcoms um, perspective, which is, the more we talk about knife crime and imagery that is shared, the more young people get scared. 
um, and that kind of perception is 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 quite a hard thing to measure. Um, and we're really excited actually through the serious violence duty and, and and the need for us to consult with young people as a partnership on issues. I'm very intrigued to see how the perceptions gap around knife crime and weapons is as a baseline today because I think that will be something that we'll need to really carefully monitor and we know that if people are um, scared about knife crime locally they'll start carrying and they'll consider themselves a need to arm so there's there's a really interesting symbiotic relationship between perception and risk that um, we don't have a baseline for and when we need one um, and similarly how head teachers in particularly um, also have their own perceptions around knife crime so whilst um, whilst it's not an immediate response other than to say that we're aware tool bays issues are increasing and um, I would urge other areas thinking around how to bring knife crime into the serious violence kind of framework to think about the professionalization of what those assets are and and, and work from there because if we know we've got something that works to de be deployed quickly after an incident such as what happened on Friday then great we're in a really good place but at the moment we can tell you if it works doesn't mean to say it doesn't we just couldn't tell you thank you becky um perhaps i could turn now to james as we've got a, a couple of questions that are more about the uh the methodology that you, that one might use in in pulling some of this together and beth and lunsdale has asked how do you engage young people to gather their voice and thoughts on serious youth violence uh, in, in the strategic needs assessment, how do you ensure that the voices captured are a fair and diverse representative of the local areas? Uh, she also asks about whether we have ex exploitation streams within the work um, and whether we'd looked at the link between serious youth violence and exploitation. Uh, and then if it's not too many to, to, to load you at once, James, there's another question from John Poyton um, asking about the public health approach and how health institutions were engaged uh, beyond the data um, and, and whether it's possible, how it's possible to do that. So something about engaging young people and their voice and something about health uh, services and, and their engagement. Of course. So I guess the first question on engaging children and young people is that, yes, it should absolutely be part of the strategic needs assessment, but you have to be clear on what you're using the information for. So thinking about the levels of prevention, all young people have a view on how safe they feel in their communities, and a survey of those young people is incredibly important to get a sense of their perceptions of serious violence, what they think their local issues are, and how they're affected by it. And you'll be surprised by how often young people will feel unsafe in areas that may not align with your hotspot areas. And it's useful to consider, therefore, the kind of context in which they feel unsafe. But at a, to ensure that the people with lived experience, specifically young people, feed in, it's also helpful to do interviews and, in particular, depth interviews looking at life trajectories and offending trajectories for young people, uh, victimization trajectories as well, because often young people uh, will have experienced uh, a service or not have experienced a service and it's useful to identify these points in their lives where they happened in relation to any incident of serious violence they've involved been involved in and work backwards to understand what, what does that mean for the activities that are provided so there's two types of engagement that you might want to focus on in a strategic needs assessment and they can both inform decision making around activities just on exploitation that was a question that we asked county lines drug markets are inherently violent in the way that they operate and therefore young people involved in them will be at risk of violence. And therefore it's, uh, in terms of the at-risk cohort of violence, it's useful to include any young people who are known to be exploited within that. Um, and yes, in terms of the stakeholders that we have worked with, they did acknowledge that there was uh, young people who experienced violence who were exploited. Um, and in terms of the last question around health, Again, it's the question of how does health data input into the strategic needs assessment? Well, the ambulance data and hospital admissions are useful proxies alongside police recorded crime to understand the scale. But what we did see looking at young people in particular is that they have a significant degree of mental health and physical um, health needs. So 39% of the young cohorts that we looked at across Devon and Cornwall had a mental health concern flagged. And a number of 20% of those young people had an identified speech and language need. So what health can also help 
provide in terms of data is the demand of health concerns on services and therefore begin to quantify what does that mean for upstream prevention how what services do we need to provide to meet the demand from things like mental health and we know nationally we struggle to make sure that young people get uh, mental health support through uh, through camp services um, so that might raise issues like how do you expedite young people at risk to those services so that they get them more quickly and finally the other way in which you can engage health as part of strategic needs assessment is that meant uh, health practitioners are key to identifying people at risk they can identify signs of sexual violence domestic abuse exploitation when they present in those situations and i think it's really important that as well as funded interventions and activities there's health improvements that can be made in terms of how practitioners uh, respond in person to the people at risk or higher at, at high risk of serious violence and i just Thank just you. to come in really quickly just to say um through our funding we've actually also got a specific um pilot taking place in plymouth um through the youth justice service and and uh and the os around ensuring um there's a pathway for um exploitation to access um early intervention diversion through the the youth offending service and and, and not coming not having to have gone through an offence to access that early support essentially so exploitation is really being focused on there alongside some family support pilot as well so i think there'll be some really interesting lessons to draw draw from that thank Mark, you if i may I, yeah, I, I was just gonna say you know because we, we're talking about this has been led by the police and crime commissioner and the chief constable we went through a process of saying do we need to have partners sat around the table? Do we need a governance board that's got every man and his dog on it in order to push this forward? And we completely understand that there is limited leadership capacity in all of these services at, that le at the high level. And I mean, it, at the man middle management level as well. So we've had to, we've kept it very tight. We've kept it very much between the police force and the Office of Police and Crime Commissioner. And we've gone out to partners because we're a big geography with four upper tier authorities, we've gone to them rather than making them come to us. And I think that, you know, it's really easy to just say, let's set up a partnership board. We need public health around the table. Well, that would be four for my area. You know, it, it ends up becoming a, a huge audience. And actually we would, I don't think we would have got as far, even though it's still taken us a while to get this far, if, if we had so many people around the table. So I think just to say from a governance perspective, we've kept it extremely, tight and we've gone out to, to to partners to assist them yeah thanks Helen um okay a, a question for Sarah if that's okay Sarah I think this this one for you Louise Machin asked whether there's an expectation that domestic abuse and sexual violence are covered under local serious violence work even where there's already a strong governance structure locally for DA uh, and where work is already happening around Vorg um, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, I mean, I think I in part sort of uh, covered it in my in my sort of presentation, but I think the simple answer is yes, you must consider it as part of your strategic needs assessment. Um, and that's what the leg the amendments to the legislation did 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 bring in. Um, I suppose how you do that is a bit bit more up to interpretation, and I think it, it is an area that we are going to look at trying to tighten up in the fine tighten up in the final version of the statutory guidance, because I think that people did felt that, that the sort of current draft wasn't perhaps as clear as it should be. Um, but I think in response to Louise's other point is obviously if you're satisfied that the work that you're doing through other mechanisms meets the requirement for domestic abuse under the duty, you shouldn't duplicate it, you know? There is no point at all in dismantling the existing structures that you have. Um, but obviously you do need to be aware, you know, for example, there might be a gap in some of the work on domestic domestic violence, perhaps, you know, some, some young, uh, the young people who, who, who witness uh, domestic violence and there might not be services or interventions in place to meet that need. So I think it is about, you know, being aware of what you have on domestic abuse uh, locally, seeing whether it covers the things that you need um, under the strategic needs ass assessment. And if it doesn't, looking at how you're going to address those. So I hope that's sort of, Partly yeah. um, answers Louise's question. Thanks, Sarah. 
Harvey, um, can I just come in on that? Go on, James. Yep. It's a, there's an interesting point because I think there's the domestic abuse uh, that, uh, strategies and then the serious violence strategies. And then where they need to look at is the overlap because exactly the offending trajectories is something that will, when you look rather than at the kind of overall picture of crime, when you look at individual offenders or individual victims, it's, it's um, you will get a proportion who will have experienced both. And therefore you can't, you can't separate those two responses. And it's similar in, in terms of the drivers of violence as well. It would be very hard pressed in a youth offending cohort to not find a young person who hasn't been affected by crime and has particularly experienced domestic abuse in the home in some way. So I think it's it's not a question of of, of duplicating, as, as I think Sarah said very well. I think it's a question of considering the overlap as it relates to serious violence. Thanks, James. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze in definitely one, possibly two more questions before we finish. So this one's probably for for Alison and and Becky. Um, interesting question from Tim Bacon, who says, following on from I think this was Becky's point about the perceptions, young people's perceptions of safety and risk. Have there been any conversations or collaboration with the local press to explore how violent crime is reported uh, and to work together to tackle the issue? Not easy. Oh, it's a good question. And do you know what, Alison, it is making me think we could do something really similar to, and uh, I'm kicking myself because I can't think of the title, the excellent work that um, your comms team have done around perceptions of victims in the press and the guidance that was issued around that. So I don't know if you want to come in on that because we could mirror something for this quite interesting thing. Well, I suppose the first thing is no, we haven't um, got a collaboration with the press in relation to anything around how violence is reported other than in relation to violence, um, the, the use of language. So the one thing we have done is we've got something called Altered Not Defined, which is a document that we've produced with people with lived experience of violence and sexual violence. Um, of how to use the right language when doing that reporting. We've um, shared that with journalists and the press. Um, so it's a document really for them to help them better report it. And it's really, really simple. And I think it, it'll be, it's available. There is a website called Altered Not Div Defined, um, which you'll be able to view that on. And, you know, if you wanted to share that in your areas with your local press, um, feel free to. We have shared it nationally. Um, but but we do have a challenge generally. I mean, I just saw the reporting from court of it said these are the men women need to be aware of that have just been convicted for serious violence. And I thought, actually, that's a really um, helpful way to, to report it rather than just say these are the lo lo latest convictions in the local court. It was saying, look, these are the men women need to avoid. And it was all their mugshots and all of their incidences of what they've done of violence against women. And I, I definitely think we're starting to take our local press um, with us on, on a journey. And we've certainly, um, work, when we work with them, they're really, really keen because they, they want to have lots of obviously clicks and they want they have that clickbait headline that they really want to get to, which we'll never solve. I don't think we'll ever solve that, but we'll certainly get the language used correctly within those articles when they're doing them. And that is to help um, people who are the victims of the, the, the violent crime um, not feel like even the press aren't on their side. And I think that's where we're trying to, to move to in that space. And just to say, Jim Colwell hasn't turned into a woman. Um, that is my chief executive, Fran Hughes. Uh, obviously Jim's had to go, but Fran is very much the architect of this whole programme uh, who uh, kick-started it and sorted it out. So she, she's got a wealth of knowledge as well for, for anyone. Just to add to the on the knife crime point, Harvey, very quickly, just to say, um, I think uh, we've just hired a, a dedicated comms and brand engagement manager of the programme who's about a month in with a view that they're able to take on some of the behavioural comms pieces of, of this work, because there is a tremendous amount of, um, of strat comms that can go in terms of like nudge behaviour and also that wider consultation and engagement with the press. And I also think as somebody in the chat mentioned earlier around the MPCC's uh, knife crime working group nationally. And I think if they're still on the line, I think this is exactly the kind of work around knife crime that would be great to fold into that group. So there's a, a bit of parity across how we're thinking about the issue and mimicking something like the altered not defined work Alison spoke to for this agenda would be, would be of tremendous value. Thanks, Becky. 
I think we're going to get timed out, I'm afraid. There are some other great questions, but um, we will be sharing uh, a recording. Uh, I think we can, I can say that, a recording of this event uh, and, and the slides as well with, with everybody who's, who, who's participating. Um, I want to just thank our panellists, uh, Alison, Jim, Sarah and Simon, uh, and of course, Becky, uh, James and Ellie from Crest, who, who have all given their time to, to talk so eloquently about the work and the challenges in Devon and Cornwall. I've learned a lot uh, over the last two hours. I think it's been a really interesting and fruitful discussion. Uh, and I hope we'll, we'll be a bit of a spur for other areas that are grappling with some of these same challenges to, uh, to come forward and, and, and think about these issues in a similar way. So thank you very much uh, and see you all soon.